This video involves a shredded Samsung battery pack from one of my old laptops. It involves good cells out that battery pack. It involves completely dead cells out that battery pack that are not even taking a charge, which is the most interesting. But it involves pink Poundland power supplies, circuit boards out of a aforementioned charger, gin and tonic, and best of all, black rubber gloves, because it's going to get scientific. Anyway, now one moment, I'm just going to have some gin. Mmm gin and tonic, Egyptian gin and tonic, very special, I should do a video about Egyptian gin and tonic, it is a custom modification. So here's what happened. Yesterday I got asked by a friend who was wanting to hack a technical thing if I had some old files and I went on an old laptop to find some old files that the manufacturers probably deleted since because they were a bit more accessible than they might want it. And while I was on, I plugged in the battery pack. Now, normally when I store old laptops, I keep the battery packs out them so they don't self-discharge. But this one uh, had been in storage so long that it had self-discharged. And what had happened is that, uh, well, it came up on the screen. It said, this battery is no longer acceptable and uh, you'll have to go and buy a new one. It's, a, it's an expendable item. And it didn't bother me too much because that is one of the shittiest laptops I've ever had. It was a Samsung fairly high-spec laptop that just suffered from lots of problems. Uh, it used to just hammer the hard disk continually, which is a Windows quirk possibly. But more importantly, the USB just gave endless problems. All the USB ports gave endless problems, which have a sneaky feeling. Given that uh, it even happened, there was nothing USB plugged in. It was internal peripherals, like I'm guessing a touchpad is USB. Uh, I reckon that it's the lead-free solder because it's from that era that lead-free solder stuff was coming out and uh, the brittle dry joints were causing problems. So uh, not the best laptop I've ever had. It was disappointing for the cost. But anyway, it uh, rejected the battery pack and I thought, okay, this happened last night. And I thought, well, what if I just open this battery pack at about four o'clock in the morning, as happens, and got the batteries out. And what I was kind of expecting was the batteries that have been, you know, they've gone just slightly below their nominal minimum voltage and then the electronic circuitry on board says, uh-uh, no, I'm not going to let you charge them again. And sometimes you can recover them by charging them anyway. But it wouldn't let me do that and it turned out that these ones really were completely dead. And the only way I can think that they were completely dead is that they got reverse charged. Now, the battery pack is an... Uh, where is it? It's a... 11.1 volt battery pack. Let's bring in the small calculator. Or do I bring in the big calculator? No, I'll bring in the small calculator. 11.1 volts divided by 3, because there's 3 pairs, equals a nominal 3.7 volts. They're basing that on, which is a typical voltage, the average voltage for a standard lithium cell. And uh, what had actually happened here, because they're all in series, these pairs, which were bonded together, each one, each group of these two cells is in parallel, and then they're all connected in series to this uh, charge regulation board with a thermistor on it. Basically, just a, a little control and connector board that uh, also um, charge balances, balances the charge when they're being charged. But uh, because there were several sets in series. What happened is I believe these were reverse charged and that is absolute death to lithium cells. Now, in the past, I made a video about lithium cells and notably the Poundland power banks because quite often, well, let's actually check this one. It's fetching and pink. So let's uh, crack this open. I've just thrown my spudger right across the bench. Here's my spudger. Let's... Uh, get this open. And one of the things about these Poundland power banks that I was a bit disconcerted about initially was the fact that quite often the cell came at below the normal minimum voltage. Now, normally when you discharge a lithium cell, the circuitry cuts off about 2.5 volts, worst case, preferably just below 3 volts. And below 3 volts, the voltage falls off suddenly. So uh, this is set to 20 volts. Let's measure the voltage of this cell. Sometimes they're zero, sometimes they're a bit higher. This one is 1.2 volts, which seems unusually low. Now, I used to think, oh, that's bad. You know, you shouldn't really recharge at that point. But it turns out it's not so critical. You see, if 
we were to look at this inside of a lithium cell, it would look like this. It would have the positive electrode, and it's made of aluminium. Aluminium. My apologies to Americans who want it as spelled as aluminum. And then it's got a separator. Uh, and on the aluminium foil, it's got a coating, a sort of graphite type coating. And the other side, the negative electrode, has a copper electrode, which is universal between America or Britain. And, and it's got a graphite type coating on it as well. And what actually happens in lithium cells, it's a common misconception that the reason they're so volatile and they explode so regularly, they don't actually explode all that regularly. That's just a media thing. Uh, the reason for that is because... Uh, the reason they, it, when they do explode is because you get a dead short circuit between positive and negative, and that suddenly unleashes all the energy. But the common misconception is that it's because it's got lithium in it, but in reality, uh, it's got an aluminium electrode with a graphite type coating, it's got a copper electrode with a graphite type coating, and it's got a very small diffusion of lithium salts. And it's the lithium is, they're so tiny. It's really, it's just a tiniest amount of lithium in these cells. It's not that's the problem. The reason they go in nuclear when they get shorted out is because of the huge amount of energy they hold. They're fantastic. They're really amazing cell technology. So what actually happens uh, is if you discharge this down to zero, and there's some research done, and if you search my videos for the word lithium, I'll put a link down below. That's the best bet. You'll find another slightly boomy video recorded elsewhere where I really scoured the internet for research on lithium uh, discharge levels. And it turns out you can actually discharge a lithium cell down to zero volts without any real major issue. And what happens when you discharge it to that low level is that most of the uh, lithium control chips... Uh, I've got the lithium... Uh, I've got my explosion containment pie dish here for a very good reason. I'm going to be taking these lithium cells apart in a moment. But uh, let me let me find... Uh, uh, let me find... Actually, I've just completely lost it. You see, seriously, before uh, I started making this video, I should have looked for these things. There it is. So let's uh, plug this into a lithium power bank. So we got a nice 5 volt supply. Let's uh, grab the little lead that came with it. And let's see how much current it charges at. I'll just reset that. So what should happen is if the lithium cell has been over discharged, the protection, the charging chip should go into a sort of safety mode and gently ease it back into the world of reality. So what's actually happening here? Yep, it's 100 milliamps. It's gently nudging it back up the 100 milliamps here. Let me just zoom in and show you that. 100 milliamps. That's not super in focus, is it? Let's uh, focus down onto that. Is that any better? Yeah, it's kind of better. Uh, so it's trickle charging at about 100 milliamps, and as soon as the voltage in the cell reaches about 2.5 to 3 volts, which is considered acceptable, it will then kick into full charge mode, and the current will suddenly go up to about uh, 500 milliamps. Oh, it's actually, it's better. It's just gone up to 1 amp. Oh, let's, uh, let's measure the voltage. Hey, where's the meter? What voltage did it deem was acceptable? Yep, the wee LED has started flashing now because it's quite happy to charge it at that. And the voltage is, yeah. As soon as it's gone above about 3 volts, it's deemed it that, you know, it's at a level that can charge properly at the full current again. That's good to know. These uh, Poundland power supplies, these little uh, power banks, are very good just for taking the cell out of. It's a typical 1 amp power cell as commonly supplied in sort of cheapy products, but it's perfectly acceptable. And you get the circuitry next to it. The one downside of the circuitry in these was it's got a fairly high standby current, uh, which is not so great, but still fine in this application. Right, so what I found out before, uh, let's uh, focus back down this again. Let's zoom in and make sure I have focused on that. Yes, I have focused on, on that. What I found out before is if you, if you discharge lithium cells to about zero volts, uh, it's fine. Usually, as long as you recover them slowly at the sort of lower current, they'll just uh, 
reform effectively the everything will just sort of settle back down and they'll take a charge and if anything they might lose a tiny percentage of charge but it's capability but it's not that significant but where a problem really occurs is if you have lots of cells in series now here is the equivalent of three cells in series. Let's just give it a random load. Let's uh, connect it to a random load like a resistor and an LED. So there's the LED being lit by three lithium cells. And initially start off fully charged, but this lithium cell here has a slightly lower capacity. It's only just a few milliamp hour lower capacity, or in this case, it would was probably a bit more, but anyway, uh, it starts off roughly about, say, 3.7 volts average across these. Current's flowing through the LED, and it's going from positive to negative. Now, I have to say, this is where I have to differentiate between uh, traditional current flow, conventional current flow, which is from positive to negative. In reality, the electrons flow from negative to positive, but that just confuses matters. The theory of electricity is based on electricity flowing from positive to negative. So what happens is the current's flowing through this. Uh, we're getting about 3.7 volts, and then we're getting another 3.7 volts, another 3.7 volts, makes up the 11 volts or so, and the LED lights. But then this one is flat, so it's at zero volts, and suddenly it's in series of the circuit where that's positive, and it's pushing current through, and it starts reverse charging that cell. Now, this used to be an issue with power tools, uh, the cordless power tools, the nickel metal the nickel cadmium power tools, the earliest ones. And uh, they used to say uh, the best thing to do is discharge the battery completely before you recharge it to avoid the memory effect. But in reality, some people did things like they'd put rubber bands or cable ties or tape around the trigger and they'd let a cordless drill run completely flat. That's a terrible idea because the first cell in a cordless drill that goes battery pack that goes flat then starts getting reverse charged and it actually causes a slight bit of damage to it and in future when you recharge it again because it's now been slightly damaged and it's got a lower capacity then the battery will run out sooner and that will again then get reverse charged further more and uh, it causes an avalanche effect that over time every time you charge and run it to completely flat it actually damaged that battery more but it's worse in the case of uh, lithium cells and that's why in this case the battery pack quite justifiably rejected it it probably tried charging it realized it wasn't going to come back and uh, condemned it which is quite acceptable in this instance because what actually happens is if you discharge it to zero that's fine but if you start reverse charging it so you've got a higher positive voltage in the negative electrode and uh, uh, the negative voltage in the positive electrode, once you go above a certain level, and the scientists involved reckoned that was about 12% the charge, if I was to work it out scientifically and say the galvanic voltage differences between copper and aluminium, because that's what comes into play here, then what you end up is you end up with an electroplating effect, effect when it reaches about, I would guess, two volts, which is the combined electron difference between aluminium and copper. And what happens then is the copper ions, the lithium has already gone across to the uh, positive electrode where it sits and just uh, in storage until you charge again. But if you over discharge it to the point that the copper starts migrating across, then that is a problem because instead of just the uh, lithium ions diffusing through this medium here, you end up with metallic copper from this foil actually traveling across and creating it gets lodged in that membrane and it creates a conductive trail through that membrane and that then effectively is a resistance and whereas the uh, the lithium cell that in the poundland power bank there was quite happy to take up charge again these ones aren't let me demonstrate with a, a cheap current meter a bench power supply and we'll try and put a charge into these and see what happens. So let's bring in my other big display meter. Uh, let's put that down to about 200 milliamps. Let's get a set of leads which I have possibly misplaced. Have I misplaced those? Yes, I have. That's quite annoying. I did look those ones out beforehand. I've lost them. There they are. So let's get some crock clips into here. 
and try charging this very defective cell. So let's uh, turn the bench power supply on. I've limited the current to about 100 milliamps. Okay. So we'll connect the positive to the positive end of the cell and the negative end, the negative charge lead, is going to go via the meter. So we're going to measure the current flowing. And we're also going to measure the voltage. This is going to get messy, not to worry. We'll sort it out. So here's a positive. That's set to 20 volts. Here's, let's start with this cell, which is showing zero volts at the moment. Uh, let's start charging it through that meter. Oop. Oh, that's uh, not going too well. Let's uh, put it onto that rag of metal there. Uh, activate the bench power supply. So it's showing about 100 milliamps and the voltage across the cell should theoretically have started climbing up, but it's not. That's not good. It should have notably started climbing at a significant rate. Okay, so let's uh, change this to the 10 amp setting and bump the current up a bit then. So now I'm going to bump it up to about, well, let's say monitor on that meter. I don't need to look at the bench power supply. So let's bump it up to about half an amp and see if we can shove some current into this cell. And the voltage, uh, even at half an amp, the voltage is not significantly rising. It's gone up to 0.11, but that might just be internal resistance. Let's bump it up even higher. Let's bump it up to an amp and see if we can punch through that. Okay, uh, the voltage is just not rising. Okay, let's try the other cell. Keep in mind these two cells are in parallel, so they would both have seen the same sort of problem. I want to mention the point of this video is that I'm going to open one of these cells. I'm going to get the worst one. I think that might be the worst one. Uh, but let's uh, try out another one. And I'm going to open it because I want to see if there's any visible effect inside on the membrane of where that copper path is formed. So this one is showing, right, this one is rising in voltage. Even at 100 milliamps, it's trying to reform just a little bit. So let's uh, cheat and bump the current up a bit. Let's bump up to about 200 milliamps, 250 milliamps as the case may be. And the voltage is rapidly going up to a sort of acceptable level. But what should happen here is that once I disconnect the current source, like this, the voltage should stay constant for a while, but the fact it's dropping so quickly suggests that there is a shunt inside and it's discharging very quickly. That uh, is not holding its uh, capacity as well. This one was the worst. This one has a serious copper shunt. So let's uh, just mark this one with a wee sort of random squiggle, just because that's the one we're about to open. More gin. Mm. Bench supply off because it's not needed anymore. We'll get some of these uh, meters out of the way and let's open that cell. Meter off, meter off. Uh, change it from the high current setting to the general setting just because uh, meters when they're left in their current setting are a dead short circuit between the leads. So you don't want to leave them accidentally in the current setting. So let's begin the science. Here is the shitty cell. Where is my pair of snips? That's not a pair of snips. I'm having minor technical avalanches here because of the cluttered state of my workbench. If your workbench is cluttered, it's the sign of science happening. So let's uh, chop that. That's the that's the medium shitty cell. This is the very shitty cell. Let's get all the, everything off it. Excellent. I'm quite intrigued. I'm going to make a guess at what's inside, but I really do not know what's inside. So I'll get rid of everything off the bench here because this may go on fire shortly. I'm going to get the explosion containment pie dish in a convenient position that I can uh, 
seek its uh, assistance when things go horribly wrong. There's a negative electrode. Let's uh, crop those off as well. Let's just rip them off completely then. And the positive electrode. Let's rip that off. We're not going to be subtle about this. And let's get the rubber gloves on. Right. So I'm going to shove my big fists into these rubber gloves and prepare for action. Now, before anybody mentions, they, those won't protect your hands from the explosive flames and things like that. It's not really for the flames. If the flames happen, they happen. Uh, the reason I'm wearing the rubber gloves, well, this cell doesn't actually contain much charge, but it does contain trace quantities of lithium, so it may get a bit messy. Um, I want to focus, actually, on a sort of comfortable position. So let's use the... Uh, let's see me... Let's... Double check that's fully focused. Yeah, that's that's focused. Yes, glass shell is more efficient, allowing more. Right, okay, that's fine. It says this is full of broken glass. I really should find a better focus target than a box full of broken glass from something I smashed earlier on deliberately. Let's also get my uh, better glasses on because I uh, I want to see everything here, as do you. Right. Let's not be subtle about this. So the reason I'm wearing the gloves is purely because uh, when I open this up, uh, inevitably people will say, oh no, it's full of dangerous chemicals and you'll get cancer and you'll die. <laughs> uh, oh look, it's got printing on the inside as well. That's quite interesting. Uh, the reason I'm just wearing them is because, well, yeah, I'm not really sure what those chemicals are. They smell great, but I'm not sure they're actually good for your skin. They smell uh, like what we would call in the UK jargonelle pears or pear drops. I'm not detecting any explosive heat yet. That's usually a good sign when you're opening lithium cells. Uh, and the smell is actually really pleasant, but people keep saying, Oh, don't breathe it. I have to say, uh, in the video where I took a... Uh, what was that? That was a jump starter. Uh, lithium pack I took apart and uh, I it was the really high current one and unfortunately it was fully charged and I took it apart which wasn't very good does this have a seal? I think this is the sealing mechanism, the vent mechanism that's designed to unleash the pressure it's got a set of crosshair in it that might be designed to actually perforate when the pressure builds up, not sure if that's a self resealing mechanism but um, when I took the other one apart I'm trying to remember what I was saying now. Uh, yeah, uh, when I took the other one apart, it was unfortunately fully charged and I took it apart and it was a super high current cell and it was lots of individual plates, which is quite interesting. Never seen that construction. This one will almost certainly, but I can see it's stuffed. This is a 2.2 amp hour cell and it's stuffed with a spiral wound foil. Oh, it smells great. Smell that carcinogenic goodness. Uh, what was I saying again? See, I've forgotten again. Okay. Anyway, let's take it apart. And uh, the cathodes that all the... Now, I don't think it was the lithium that combusted, but something did combust. And unfortunately, it happened off camera. It was uh, while I was uh, playing about after making the video that I had a big pile. I'd separated all the plates into the anodes and the cathodes. And when you charge a lithium cell, a lot of ions are transferred. The lithium ions are transferred to the cathode and it's stored on the cathode for later release back, generating current flow through your load. And uh, just for... Well, it was unexpected completely. It just absolutely... The pile of cathodes just exploded in flames. It was just like there was a hiss and the top one went, and then they all just went, and it just went, woomph! And there was loads of smoke, and the place absolutely stank for ages. I had to open all the windows, and I was thinking, oh dear, is this carcinogenic? I'm not really sure. But uh, anyway, it happened, uh, and... Uh, now that I know that uh, stuff like this does occasionally burst into flames, where's a knife? And I'll split this. Uh, now I know that when I uh, finish with this, I'll be going outside. There is a storm blazing outside, as there usually is uh, here. But I'll be going outside and I'll be putting it in one of the many tins I have for storing 
dodgy stuff. Now, here is the copper electrode. Here is the cathode, which is connected onto the outer shell of the case. That was probably connected onto the bottom of this. Um, is there any visible sign? Yes, there is. There's a little bit of a sign of the tab down there, which you're not going to see because this is far too bright. Okay, there is a little bit of a tab down there. Uh, and then the other electrode is the aluminium electrode, and they've got this black coating on them. And what I'm looking for, and we might not see it, but there's only one way to find out, and that's to open it, is some obvious pattern, something that's made a hole through this. I'm looking for a start, I'm seeing this. That is just a bit of uh, the coating off that electrode. This cell is absolutely stuffed. It really is. To make these, they put the layer of the, uh, the sort of membrane between the copper and the aluminium and then they sort of wind it on itself. They wind it tightly from the centre uh, so it forms a sort of spiral effect. It's very shiny aluminium. And I can see all the stuff, all the coating, all the electrode coatings coming off here, which is a bit unfortunate. Right, okay, I think we're just going to have to unroll the whole thing. The coating is coming off the electrode, which is a bit disappointing. That uh, grey stuff is the, uh, the carrier. It holds the electrons. Uh, in this case, it's coming off. Which electrodes are coming off here? The aluminium one, this uh, silvery one, is the anode. I'm not sure which one the stuff is separating from here, though. If it's the anode or the cathode. So I get to the middle, and theoretically, all oh, right, okay. Let's see if we can separate out the copper. It's not a huge amount of copper, is it? Relatively speaking inside, the construction of these, the materials, the amount of them, isn't actually significant. It's mostly separator in the middle. I'm being very careful about pinging material. Unfortunately, I had a terrible experience with nickel metal hydride cells where I did ping material in amongst... Uh, so it's a very thin layer of copper. Uh, I did ping the sort of like this material here in amongst all my stuff in the vicinity and then it started self-combusting, which was quite interesting. So that coating has come completely off the copper. That is the charge holding stuff. What I'm seeing here is nothing really obvious as to where the copper might have been. The reason that stuff may have come off is because it is totally over discharge and it's kind of, it's uh, it's lost its connection to the surface of the copper. Well, let's go further. I'm wanting the clear separator here. I'm looking for something obvious that a hole has actually perforated and unfortunately the material, the electrode, the graphite type substance that uh, acts as a sort of storage medium for the lithium ions is unfortunately coming off on the bit that I'm really interested in. This is not good because I was hoping that the middle transparent translucent type electrode separator was going to actually... So there's the anode which still has some stuff on it. That's disappointing. Ah... That is disappointing. I was hoping to see a really obvious defect. I was actually secretly hoping to see a sort of uh, slightly greenish coloured hole through that, or a sort of staining in this membrane that showed where the uh, the conduct, the uh, breakthrough had occurred, where the copper had gone through this and stained the uh, material, but really, the electrode, the actual, the graphite type substance has totally bonded onto uh, the separator, which is hugely disappointing here. That's not going to make it easy at all. Oh, that is 
hugely disappointing. Yeah, seriously, it's coated on both sides. That is just such an annoyance. There's no sign at all where it's perforated through. I don't think, uh, this is the bit that if they get too hot, if lithium cells get too hot, I think one of the biggest problems is this stuff breaks down, this insulating layer between them. And uh, once you get a tiny hot spot forms, once the current starts flowing, it will melt that back and there's a risk you're going to get a dead short circuit through it. Uh, this is not revealing what I wanted to see. This is revealing very little. I'm also, also being very cautious about where this stuff goes just in case it does that burst into flames things, as occasionally happens. But I'm not seeing any obvious sign at all. That is hugely disappointing. I wonder if there's any other way I can remove this. I wonder if I could take it to the sink and just wash it out. I'm just cautious about it. Uh, having had some, shall we say, incidents in the past, I'm very cautious about what I do with these materials. Oh, this isn't good. It's crumbly, right? You know what? I'm going to go outside. I'm going to try and scrape this off outside uh, and then see what it looks like. So I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so here's the first one. I have to say, I took it outside and I tried scraping it off. No joy. I tried scrumpling it up and that had an effect, but it created clouds and clouds of grey powder with lithium in it that probably wasn't the best thing to breathe. Uh, then I went to the kitchen sink and sort of washed off the rest and I'm not seeing anything immediately. Uh-oh. Rightio, it's just started re-recording again. It's done that again, yep. Yeah. Okay, so that means it's quite a long video. It's just started re-recording. Uh, it makes us a ping noise, and then it stops recording after about... I, I'm not sure, there's a file size that it starts recording after. It's really common in the phones. But anyway, I'm not seeing anything really obvious here, so the next thing I'm going to have to look for is in the next film. I'm going to have to try and dissolve off this stuff. I'm going to try it at the kitchen sink again, so I'll be back in a moment. Continuing on... Uh, the foils, the, well, the, the separators, I've now cleaned them as far as I could, and I was kind of hoping for uh, one of them at least to have some sort of, of visible discoloration where the copper ions had diffused through, but I'm not seeing that at all. What I am seeing is that at the end here, where the material ended, there is a slight translucency. I wonder if that's... Uh, can I show that in any way? Would it actually show up if I... No, that's just swamping out. Is that going to show the slight transistency? It's not really going to show the slight transistency. It was worth a go. Uh, so that's one of those uh, layers that I just can't see anything on. And the other one, now that I've scrubbed all the coating off it again, there's nothing really obvious to show where that conductive path has formed through plastic. It could have been the thickness of a hair. There are a few still, still a few specks of the material on it, but nothing uh, that I think is really hiding where this failed. That's disappointing. I was hoping for something more obvious. I will say of the copper foil, there is a slight area that looks etched here. So it may have happened near the end of the foil. And that's the only area that actually looks like that, that it looks uh, slightly discoloured. Yeah, that's the only bit there that looks slightly etched. So maybe that's where the uh, copper has been transferring across, and that bit's shiny in there. Now that might just be where the material didn't stick when they were uh, coating it. I'm not seeing anything that correlates in the transparent film. I am seeing a slightly transparenter bit there, but, you know, the rest of it is a milky coloured. It's a pattern. It's not really, it's not really revealing much. That's disappointing. I've had hoped for something more obvious. Yeah, there's transparent sections of this as well. I'm not sure if that's just down to low chemistry adhesion or maybe just because they're the, where it was spiral wound, it didn't quite press as tightly in those areas. 
Nothing really obvious. What about the aluminum? Anything really obvious in this? Anything to match that other pattern that I saw in the other copper? Not really. It's very shiny there, but that might just be where they've uh, laminated at the end. Nothing really obvious. That's disappointing. I really thought, you know, there was going to be something visible. Another thing that's interesting about the construction of this is there was a very distinct core. A pl uh, well, I was going to say a plastic core. It's not plastic, it's metal. Uh, hold on, what is this? I presume this is metal. Let's put this to continuity and check. I don't think it's plastic. It feels metal. -y. It's metal. Uh, is it magnetic? Is it steel? Oh, it's a, it's a kind of... It does, it, maybe it's stainless or something like that because uh, it's got a slight magnetic attraction. So there is a core that they've put into this and then they've wound it round it tightly. That may be part of the secret of just how they managed to cram so much chemistry in by binding it on quite tightly onto this core. So um, that was interesting to take apart, but non-conclusive. It didn't show where that had failed from the positive electrode to the negative electrode, although it definitely had, because of the characteristics it was showing. But having said that, it was worth doing, and now I have to go and clean my kitchen sink up, because it is now covered in lithium -y type loaded graphite -y type stuff. And I want to mention that, despite the fact I was washing this off, uh, at no point was there anything that indicated a volatile level of lithium. Nothing went boom. Not that I'm going to be uh, taking any risks. All this stuff is going into uh, one of Mark's Scotty Dog shortbread tins. Uh, and then it's going to be put outside overnight. Because I'm not leaving this inside overnight. Just in case something does go up in flames, as occasionally happens. So, uh, yes. So that was interesting, but totally non-conclusive, but also totally worth doing anyway.